The Graymore Friars present the Ave Maria Hour. Friars Monastery is located on Atonement Mountain near Garrison, New York. Adjacent to this famous monastery, one sees St. Christopher's Inn. Homeless men from all walks of life come to this famous inn. These men are fed and sheltered by the Graymore Friars, and no distinction is ever made of race, creed, or color. are invited to listen to the first chapter of the dramatized story, The Life of Christ, brought to you transcribed each week by the Graymore Friars, who offer this new series in the devout belief that the retelling of his tragedy and triumph will reawaken and strengthen your faith in and love of Christ. Now, chapter one, The Coming of of John the Baptist. Speak ye to the heart of Jerusalem, and call to her, thou that bringest good tidings to Zion. Lift up thy voice with strength, thou that bringest good tidings to Jerusalem. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judea, Behold your God. Now the time was the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar when Herod Antipas was tetrarch of Galilee, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, when Pontius Pilate was but recently come as procurator of Judea, bringing with him by special permission of Tiberius, his wife, Claudia Procula. Pontius, will you be busy this morning? I may be, Claudia. Why do you ask? I must discuss the refurnishing of the palace. Valerius has let everything go to ruin. If you can get along on what we have for a while, until I can... Conscious, we must have artisans in at once to make repairs. We need rugs, couches, draperies. It will take a great deal of money. Right now, I don't have it. Then borrow it. Borrow? Yes, Pontius. Don't you understand that one reason for asking for this assignment was to escape my creditors in Rome? But don't you realize how a magnificent palace reflects you? It'll impress people with your position. It will... I realize that, Claudia, even more than you. You may be sure I'll take care of the palace as soon as I can raise the money. When will that be? Not too long. Before Valerius left, he opened my eyes to the wealth of the Jews and the ways and means of filling my own coffers. So be patient for a while. Soon you'll have all the luxuries of Rome and more. Then, instead of having local artisans do the repairs, you can go to Damascus for what we need. Damascus? Oh, Pontius, that'll be wonderful. Once the palace is fitted out, it becomes my position, and we can entertain. You won't mind this country so much. Well... To be truthful, Pontius, I don't dislike it now, as when we first came. There 
There's something mysterious and haunting about these people and their religion. And an expectancy, as if they are waiting for something, have been waiting for centuries, and could go on forever. Yes, waiting for one thing. And what is that? The day Rome will no longer rule them. These petty tribes and nations hate each other, and the factions hate each other, but they have one thing in common. They all hate Rome. Tiberius rules them by balancing greed and hate of one faction against another. In fact, uh, Caiaphas, the leader of one powerful faction, is coming this morning. Caiaphas? Isn't he the one called the high priest? Yes. Now, what is he, a Pharisee? No, he's a Sadducee. They happen to control the priesthood. Have for several decades. How do you tell a Pharisee from a Sadducee? Not by looking at them. They differ primarily on concept of law. The Sadducees insist on strict adherence to the written law. The Pharisees insist that the oral laws, traditions, sayings of the wise men and the scribes take precedence over the written law. Who are the scribes? Men who spend their lives learning the laws, oral and written, and interpreting them. They're lawyers, really, and very important. No Jew dares sneeze, unless in a manner legalized by the scribes. I see. Pontius? Yes, Claudia? There are a lot of strange-looking people entering the courtyard. That will be Caiaphas and the delegation. Well, why do they stand there? Why don't they come further? <laughs> they say they defile themselves by entering the house of a non-Jew. Will I meet them? Indeed not. Some of these leaders are so fanatical, they shut their eyes and turn their heads to the wall to avoid looking at a woman. And is that in their laws? That's in their laws. I certainly don't see... I must not keep them waiting, Claudia. And after I'm through with them, we'll go over the palace and see what is needed to put it in condition. High priest, let's understand each other from the first. Very well. My duties here are simple. Keep peace, improve the country, and collect the taxes for Tiberius. May I remind you, Judea is not a simple country. So Valerius advised me. But mind you, I'll carry out my duties regardless of any opposition. Be assured there'll be no trouble. Fine. No doubt Valerius told you it is the policy of the Sanhedrin, our governing body, to get along with Rome. Only because you need Rome to keep your priestly family in power. Uh, but we... Now, don't pretend to me that the Jews have any love for Rome. We must consider our history. The Jews have always fought for independence, but without success. Some great power always overcame us. We realize that we can't win against Caesar, nor do we wish to try. He has given us good government and peace for the most part. Have the Jews given Caesar peace in return? Valerius informed me that any fanatic can collect a following against Rome. We too deplore these agitators. But they always come out of Galilee where Herod Antipas rules and... Try to stir up trouble in Judea. I know that game, but that's beside the point. What I want to know is, why can any fanatic from Galilee raise a following in Judea? Why do you permit it? Judea is filled with isolated retreats where people can gather without being detected. Granted, but the question still is, why are the people so easily persuaded to gather and cause trouble? Again, you must consider our history, our traditions, our religious beliefs. Such as? All Jews believe that someday a deliverer will arise to restore the ancient power and glory of our people. It has been promised us by God. Do you believe it, high priest? I am a Jew. However, do not be uneasy, procurator. The learned men agree the time of our deliverance is far off. 
Some of them reason that the promise does not apply to this life, but to that which comes after the man is dead. Hmm, very sensible view. But how about the ignorant, unlearned people who gather in these isolated retreats in Judea? I am afraid, Procurator, the ordinary Jew, the farmer, the fisherman, and the like, sees the future differently. The more he is taxed by the conqueror, the more he looks for and hopes for a deliverer. Perhaps that's why these agitators are so successful. And this deliverer, who is it to be? He will be called the Messiah. How will he be recognized? The ancient scriptures have informed us. Before the Messiah appears himself, a messenger will be sent to prepare the way. This is all very interesting, Kyvers. Now some unscrupulous adventurer could use this, this legend to his own advantage. A number have tried in the past, but you may be sure we know how to deal with a false messiah. Achaevus, I would like assurance from you that this messiah will not arrive during my term of office. Rest at ease, procurator. He will not arrive during my lifetime or yours. But even as Caiaphas spoke, travelers along the ancient Jordan Road saw a man, wild in appearance, dressed in garments of camel's hair like the prophets of old, and with a leather girdle about his loins. He stood at the crossing of the Jordan and lifted his voice to all who passed. If a hen lay an egg on the Sabbath, you must not eat it. That is the law. Oh, who cares when the egg was laid? And how does the hen know it's the Sabbath? Is that all you scribes have to do? Watch chickens laying eggs? <laughs> Speak civilly to your better soldier, or you will find yourself in trouble. <laughs> my, my betters, is it, eh? The only thing you can better me at is splitting a hair. Before long, a man will have to run to you, scribe, to find out if it's proper to breathe on the Sabbath. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Wait, what's that? Uh, over there, that wild-looking fellow is calling out. What did you say? Do penance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, hear that, scribe? Who is that fellow? I've never seen him before. Come, we haven't time to listen to every half-crazed hermit. We've got to get on to Jerusalem. Repent. Do penance. But many stopped to listen to the strange man, and then passed on. But the words lingered in their minds, and they spoke the words to others. Then went out to him all the country of Jordan and all they of Jerusalem. Common people came with hope in their hearts, and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees came, for they would test this man. Silence! Fellow, you speak of things beyond your intelligence. I doubt if you know anything of the law, but we'll find out. Now tell me this. If a hen lays an egg on the Sabbath, is it lawful? Oh, oh my God. God. Yes, yes, yes. Master, to be saved, what must we do? Be baptized. Do penance for the remission of sins. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But we are of Abraham. Brood of vipers! Who has shown you how to flee from the wrath to come? Bring fruits, therefore be fitting repentance, and do not begin to say, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you, 
God is able out of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. For even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that is not bringing forth fruit is to be cut down and thrown into the fire. Oh, master, master, what then are we to do? Let him who has two tunics share with him who has none. And let him who has food do likewise. We who are tax collectors, what are we to do? Exact no more than what has been appointed you. And we who are soldiers, what are we to do? Plunder no one, accuse no one falsely, and be content with your pay. I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I is coming. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will clean out the threshing floor and will gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. I've listened to a lot of these fellows, but none ever spoke as does this man. Who can he be? He speaks of a greater to come. He makes no claim to being the Messiah. Fellow, what's your name? Where are you from? My name is John. I come from out the wilderness. I don't know who he is, but he speaks with authority. I'm asking to be baptized. And the news spread of this strange, wild-looking man who called out at the crossing of the Jordan. And people flocked to him from the cities of Judea and Transjordan and beyond, even unto Nazareth in Galilee, where a carpenter was busy in his shop. Jesus, I've come for my chair. Is it finished? Yes. Over there. Ah. I'd have come sooner, but I was delayed at the crossing. Jesus, I was baptized. There was a man whose name is John standing at the crossing, and he was calling out to all who passed by, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was dressed in a garment of camel's hair, and how he spoke. Not like the scribes reciting the law, but like the prophets of old. And such was the authority of his voice that all stopped and listened, and many were baptized. Jesus, what is it? Why do you take off your apron? Where are you going? To the crossing. And Jesus walked toward the crossing where John was preaching to the crowds. And the spies from Jerusalem listened and sent their reports to Caiaphas and Pilate. Pontius, what is that paper over which you frown? A report from Joseph, my informant. I sent him to check on a fellow called John the Baptist. And who is John the Baptist? According to Joseph... A half-clad, half-starved, and half-crazed hermit who's telling the Jews the great time they've been waiting for has arrived. Hmm. Sounds like one of those against whom Valerius warned. Surely he's not fool enough to challenge Rome. This will amuse you. John's telling the Jews in order to be worthy of the great day, they must humble themselves and confess their sins. I can see old Annis and Caiaphas and the rest of that stiff-necked crowd humbling themselves at the command of some ragged fanatic. Uh, Just the same, Joseph writes that everyone's poised and waiting for something to happen if this fellow proclaims himself the appointed one. What will you do? That's the problem. Sure as I arrest him, Caiaphas will tell the people I've silenced some poor Jew for nothing more than preaching their religion. Listen to this. 
About 30 years ago, it was rumored some mysterious child born in Bethlehem was a threat to the throne of Herod the Great. He was so concerned that he ordered every child in Bethlehem, aged two or less, put to death. How horrible. Now, uh, writes Joseph, the rumors crop up again, and some say there is a connection between the events of 30 years ago and John the Baptist. John is just the right age for it. That settles it. I must act. You'll arrest John? Not if I can avoid it. I shall write to Caiaphas and ask him why this man has not been reported to me. Why delay arrest if he's so dangerous? My letter will prod them. You may be sure they'll act quickly if they think John is a menace. If this is a religious matter, I want to stay clear of it. At the crossing of the Jordan, the people came to John and asked to be baptized. Among them was the carpenter from Nazareth, who patiently waited his turn. And because of the eagerness of others, he was the last to come to John. It is he. Dost thou come to me? It is I who ought to be baptized by thee. Let it be so now, for so it becomes us to fulfill all justice. Look at that fellow. Hmm? Who? Jesus? The last to be baptized. Didn't you notice anything different? Well, he was baptized, as were the others. But he didn't stop to make a confession. He went to that spot near the tree. He's praying. Maybe he has nothing to confess. Nonsense. No man's that pure. Well, I've known Jesus and his family since they came to Nazareth. He's a quiet, gentle man. Look at that dog. He's flown to Jesus. He's lighted on him. Everyone seems to be listening to something. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. In thee I am well pleased. I don't hear anything except the wind and the trees. Did you hear anything? I... I thought I did. But no. No. It was just the wind and the trees. the heart of Jerusalem, and call to her, thou that bringest good tidings to Zion. Lift up thy voice with strength, thou that bringest good tidings to Jerusalem. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judea, behold your God.